Hi there and welcome to Lorena's Labyrinth. If this is your first visit, my name is Anna Pirelli and I'm the business owner here. I'm also a teacher of energy and you can hear more about my training and qualifications if you like by viewing the video about me. I'll pop a link in the description. So very briefly though, I've been working consciously with energy and developing my pool of knowledge around the process for the last 23 years, which is when I first consciously started to my journey. Now, when I consciously came into it, I was actually a skeptic. I had a very rational and logical side to myself. I believed in psychic visions and prophecy and seeing spirit because these were part of my experiences across my life path. However, once I started trying to develop and manage these gifts, um, I had to develop a new understanding of energy and that was a totally new concept for me, uh, especially when it came to the concepts of healing energy. So my mind was um, open to the possibility of energy because of me witnessing some really incredible instances which many would refer to as unbelievable, even me at the time, and what others would call miracles, and they certainly appeared to be miraculous to me at the time. I became enthralled by the concepts of magic, and I say that with the I-C-K-E ending, and I wanted to know more. So I spent many years developing my understandings for practical purposes because my perception was that what is the point of having gifts if they don't enhance the quality of our life. Now, the beauty was that where I was living at the time, it was a remote area of Australia and we simply did not have access to teachers and I became very reliant on my own, what I refer to as intuition and later my guides to direct me to places, people, books where I could learn um, to find my answers and how to ask the questions. Now, one of my understandings that I've learned over the years is that the spirit world is not a case of one size fits all. Because we're all different, and this includes the way we ask our questions and the way we receive our answers, our journey is individual. And I just keep reiterating that all the way through. So my information that I present may or may not resonate with you, and that is perfectly fine. In this video, all I'm aiming to do is share my understandings and conclusions that I've come to across the life path so far. And these understandings may change as well in the future. So as I said before, I started this journey very skeptical around energy and in fact thinking a lot of people off with the theories when they were having conversations about it. So when we think about skeptics, we're talking about people that need to have um, a logical and a rational understanding of everything basically. Um, and we have to look at, in this process, we have to look at, well, what is a fact? What What is scientific? What's a scientific truth, you know? Um, a guy, I'm not sure if I've got his pronunciation right here, Girafalco, he said that scientific truth or facts are those that have been tested and they're verified um, and they're also tangible and physical. Now, Ellerton, a philosopher on critical thinking, he's made the point that scientific truth conveys a credibility to it and this is what skeptics are attracted to. You know, we can touch it, we can see it, we can smell it if you like. But he makes the point that there is more than one truth, right? Um, I would take it a bit further and say that I agree with both of them, but there are limitations upon scientific truth anyway at the best of times. They can only research facts based on the evidence that they have or the theories that are pre presented to them. Now, a prime example of what I mean by scientific limitations and um, even actually a level of close-minded is this particular diva mummy, which I'll talk about in a moment, is historically, well, more recent scientists have said that um, conditions such as heart disease and um, gallbladder, I think gallstone, stuff like that, that these are modern illnesses and part of our lifestyle. And they were very categoric, very firm with this. These are modern conditions, right? Now where the diva mummy comes into play or has relevance is she is a Chinese body. She's certainly not very pretty. She's called a diva because actually how well preserved she's been. She was discovered oh, probably a few decades ago, but because of scientific advances, and she's about 2,000 years old, scientists have been able to do an autopsy on her and establish her cause of death. And what they identified was that she actually died because she had a gallstone stuck in a bile duct 
and she had, um, I said duck with no teeth, and that's quite funny, but bile duct, right? Um, so she died because of that and because she actually had heart disease and they believe that what happened was that she would have been in incredible pain and that would have triggered the heart attack and this is why she died. Now, so this is why I say science is limited in itself when it comes to its truth. They only know what they know based on, they, on what they know and the questions they know to ask and they reach their own conclusions and those scientific facts become scientific truth until they get new information, such as with the diva mummy. So hopefully you're taking that on board. So we'll talk about inductive learning in a minute, but for now I'm going to return to this point of um, energy and vibration and scientific limitations, right? And this particular quote is one that was given to me many years ago, around about the same time I started my journey. I was also attending university to do, well, not university, TAFE. I was doing a pre-uni course. And my lecturer was actually a professor of economics. She'd changed her fields and uh, she considered herself to be a mathematician. Um, she was also new to Australia and she told us that her comfort levels lay with maths and not necessarily humanities, which was what I was looking to study. Um, because she understood scientific facts better than she did people. And I truly love a person that knows their own limitations. Anyway, during one of our classroom conversations, she made the comment that I've put on the slide here and it stuck with me. Scientific truth is variable and based on the facts that are available at any given time. What is true today can be proved or disproved tomorrow, right? And our little diva mummy demonstrates just how accurate her comment was. And there are other limitations as well, such as if they do decide to research any particular given topic, who's going to fund it? Um, is there a bias and a prejudice in those people that are capturing the information? I know universities like to think that they're impartial, but at the end of the day, if they're doing research on anything, um, the funders generally have a vested interest in the outcome. Like a prime example of this is you'll know that Big Pharma will do um, research on say essential oils and the healing properties of plants and that kind of thing because they can bottle it and sell it right but which big pharma company do you know of that's going to fund perhaps a research project into things like color healing or sound healing um, you know so this is going to restrict how much of the so-called scientific fact based evidence we can have or scientific truths I'm going to continue to refer to Ellerton's um, descriptions of the types of truth that are available because he covers a lot of them. Um, and so what he's, this is a copy and paste that I've put on the slide of how he explains subjective truth. But in essence, it's about our personal and lived experience of the world and the feelings that we associate with those experiences. They're not necessarily shared with other people. They're simply our truth, our personal truth. And they're based on our sensory experience of what things feel, look like, etc. You know, and this can go some way to us, um, you know, even the way we describe things, like we know that if we turn around and say to somebody, oh, the grass is green, the colour green is going to look completely different in Ireland, um, as in the land of the Irish, than it's going to look if we look at grass here in Australia. Our, um, our green grass is very pale, shall we say, whereas if you go over to Ireland, it's actually very green and almost emerald green in some spots. So these become subjective truths. And in fact, actually, the, they're the points that people can argue about. So Allerton also describes uh, deductive truths as here. They, um, they have a certain logic and rationale to them, but they're not necessarily true, right? They can actually be quite assumptive. So, for instance, where he uses the concept of the imaginary green gronk and reaches a fairly accurate conclusion based on this, if it is true that all gronks are green, um, but what if we was to say, uh, I'm really digging deep here to find an example with a false conclusion, actually, I'll refer to a personal experience of a flawed deduction that has little relevant, um, relevance here, but what the heck. Okay, so deductive truth that's flawed. My ancestry does not include Europe or Scandinavia. When I look at my family tree, none of it there. 
Now, to my knowledge, I had concluded, based on a deductive truth, that I was primarily Irish, with a little bit of Scottish and a little bit of smidgen in my ancestry. And my family has been living in Australia for multiple generations. And um, within the Australian context, we can see who married who, and it certainly looked that way. So I concluded that I was almost pure Irish. I actually am. I've had my DNA done and I'm actually 70 70% 70% Irish, I think. Um, but anyway, I found it very difficult, the whole, well, I never even considered it, is more the point, that I might have Scandinavian in my blood. Now, in fact, I don't, right? When I've done my ancestry, I do not have any Scandinavian in my blood. And yet a few years back, my granddaughter was born with a genetic condition genetic meaning that it's inherited um, and it has to apparently come from both sides of the family that includes me apparently I'm a carrier of this condition it's called PKU by the way Um, you can do your research on that but anyway apparently it started in Scandinavia and only Scandinavians have it I may not be correct in all of this but anyway looking at my DNA I don't even have Scandinavian showing there so you know we would assume that actually the doctors have got all their research wrong but where it gets bizarre is that my son had his DNA done and it shows that he's got um, a percentage of Scandinavian blood in him and you think oh well he must have got it from his father because he can't have got it from me but in the DNA breakdown it actually shows that he inherited three percent of his Scandinavian from me I do carry it I had no idea So then I became very interested in researching my family tree based on, so now we're moving from a false or flawed deductive truth through to getting scientific research. What I had established is that parts of um, Ireland and Scotland where my family came from historically had been subjected to Viking invasions. So I would say deductive truth is not always reliable either, just stating my opinion there. So hopefully I convey this one well, all right? Allerton talks about inductive truth and he explains that it's a case of analogy and it's very generalized and it's based on a person's experience where they reach justifiable conclusions, but there's no empirical, that means there is no scientific research or scientific truth established to support that person's truth, all right? Or their belief. Um, So when we talk about energy workers, we're talking about people that are actually reliant on inductive truth. Um, Because remember, when we talk about science and scientific truth, that means they've done the research, the numbers of the people. You know, we uh, spoke with 500 people, we asked them these questions and 400 out of 500 say that this was true for them. So they can reach a conclusion through um, the mathematical basis, which is very important to scientific research. But um, an inductive truth or a person's personal truth tends to be our philosophies and our beliefs. And as I said, this is generally associated with spiritual or religion, um, where there's been very little testing done to uphold these um, on, on a wider level. You can speak to many of us out here and we may have shared experience and shared beliefs, but there's no scientific substance to it. So I reiterate this. Um, generally the way we test something as individuals is does it feel right to me does it resonate with me does it feel right in my heart because there is actually no other means of testing a lot of the stuff that we're looking at so I will make a reference however to a spiritual practice that I believe should be considered and this is the information that has been provided to me by other credible philosophers if you like an example of this in my experience can be the use of tarot cards right because obviously i provide services using tarot and they are my communication tool now what i mean by this is for each of my tarot cards i have a meaning that is attached to them because it feels right now i know when i'm doing a reading on somebody that when a particular card jumps from the pack I am able to turn around and say, based on my inductive truth and my rational truth, that my interpretation of this particular card means X and Y. Um, and generally, when they jump out the pack, I am 
99% right with the way I interpret these cards. Now, I'm just going to clarify this because that makes it sound like I'm saying that I am a 100% brilliant psychic um, delivering accurate readings. N nobody is, okay? What I'm making the point of is that my understanding of the cards is very accurate for me. I do have a way of interpreting them, right? Now, I'm just trying to think how else we would put this. When we're talking about delivering a psychic reading, it's n the cards are more than a tool. Uh, of, there's more to a psychic reading than looking at your cards and interpreting them. There is the questions that lie behind the reasons for pulling the cards, and it's how you interpret the meaning of it. So basically, um, the way that I'm describing it within, uh, when I say that I'm 99% accurate for this, right, is that I can use them to validate a connection because when these cards come out I can say to a person um, it appears to me X and Y has been happening in your life because this is what this card usually tells me when it jumps out every now and again I might uh, not be quite on the mark but a prime example of this is I've got one particular card and I can say the card refers to somebody who is either 14 years old Sometimes I can pick that it's a female, um, but I get the feeling that this person is much younger, but they've got the attitude, right? This becomes the validation and somebody, the person that I'm reading with will turn around and say to me, oh my God, I was just saying to somebody yesterday, my five-year-old is like a 15-year-old and she's got an attitude to match. So they can relate to what it is I'm saying. So equally, if a person comes up to you on the street and says you have children and one is five, um, I'd be turning around, I don't know about you, but I'd be turning around saying to them, yeah, and so what, right? And the point is, you know, so just because you can interpret a card doesn't mean that it adds value to a person's life is what I'm saying. So, yeah, there's a big difference there. Anyway, moving on. Now, we're just going to have a little bit of a look at what we call consciousness theory or information integration theory, because this is a scientific concept, right? And if you have the brain power to research this subject, you, you might find it very interesting as I do, um, but it is enough to make my brain explode. Now, the reason I'm putting this in is because even if you've got scientific facts, you still end up with professional debate and argument. Um, over what is or isn't. Now, we're talking about modern scientists with this theory who are attempting to test the content of matter, consciousness and so forth, um, that we are all things, which is basically the awareness stuff that we talk about. God, I hope you don't hear that truck going past. Right. The point I'm trying to make is that we are about universal knowledge and wisdom. It's not visible to the naked eye. And scientists, interestingly, can accept concepts such as blood cells, the um, neural pathways, neurons, and so forth, um, because they can test these, right? So they can feel very comfortable with this, but they will struggle to accept anything that literally can't be put into a box. So from what I can tell, historically, scientists of the past were actually men and women of faith and their desire for problem sol solving wasn't mutually separate from their faith. In fact, many of these great achievers, scientific achievers, were divinely inspired and they had a deep faith. Pythagoras certainly did. Um, what we see in modernity is that those people that want to test ancient ideas such as consciousness and theory are often pilloried by their colleagues despite having received mainstream respect in their professional community for their other grand achievements. And I find that very interesting. It's like if you want to test anything associated with humanity and brotherhood, care, divinity and all the rest of it, it seems to put you on the outside. And to me, that's not open-minded. I believe that actually goes against the scientific nature of questioning. But moving on again. So in some circles, the studies of consciousness are referred to as pseudoscience and linked in derogatory ways. Um, alternative healing is often referred to as pop psychology either. So neither of these terms by mainstream scientists instead of ways are, are set in ways that are supportive. And this is despite the fact that many scientists and qualified clinicians will draw upon what we call spiritual strategy as part of supporting health and well-being. And I personally find the negative comments to be both surprising and disappointing because in my understanding of scientists as a definition of their professional 
constitutional approach is one that should be of an open mind and allow the evidence to support the questions or to disprove it and that it would be unscientific to have formed an opinion about the credibility of a topic before the research has been conducted. Um, least of all, because quite often it can be many years or decades or even centuries before some of these ideas are validated by maths. So no one, for instance, in the modern time frame is going to question Tesla's contributions to humanity. Um, but it was not that long ago that he was considered a bit of a weirdo and insane even. Einstein was also considered a bit of a fruitcake by many. Um, and then there's the matter of Darwinism where not all of his theories are supported with evidence either. So it seems that the modern scientist cherry picks from the ideas of, um, of the great thinkers, if you like. They cherry pick, but they don't research all the content, but they can condemn a content or an idea simply without the research. That to me is unscientific. So speaking of science, let's talk about Pythagoras, who lived about 525 BC. And he was primarily reliant on the brilliance of his own mind and his colleagues or peers at the time. So just to state the obvious, there are actually no true images of Pythagoras. And as far as we know, he didn't leave any records of books or, or books, of course, right? Most of the theories he brought to the world have been proven to be true in the fields of maths, music and astrology as prime examples. Not all, of course, and certainly not the theories of consciousness or vibrational healing. I do understand, however, that in India in the early 1900s, there was some research being conducted into the healing properties of colour called chromotherapy, but the research was not concluded. It was cancelled mid-project or something. Perhaps they ran out of funding. We all know from a subjective or inductive process that music, sound and colours impact on our mood in positive or negative ways, but there is no scientific truth or maths um, as to why this might occur. So it still remains a theory. However, at the same time, Pythagoras made these links during his lifetime as well, um, but I'm not sure about the mathematical substance to it, but he certainly had an open mind. So now let's explore, or I will explain, my own subjective and deductive reasoning as a skeptic and trying to be open-minded and not allow the biases that I'd been taught throughout my own early education to warp my processing around understanding energy. So at the time that the lecturer passed on the little chestnut or her little chestnut, I'd also discovered this lady here, Helena P. Plavatsky. Um, and around about, she had a quote that I saw around about the same time. Now, Helena was a theosophist and she was known as, and she, well, she's recorded as a seeker of wisdom. And I'd started researching her based on my guides and some information that I'd received in my dream state. That's a story for another day. You can find a lot of literature about Helena um, from people with opinions on both sides of the fence um, around her legitimacy and whether or not she was a fraud. But the background is that she was a Russian mystic and a spiritual truth seeker. So this is recorded. Um, whether people believe her as a fraud or not, she's widely considered to be the godmother of the new age or the spiritual movement. So she was extremely well-traveled and during her quest, she spent some time in the Tibetan monasteries. Now, I've also seen her referred to as an ascended master by some groups. Now, in regard to statements such as these, of course, that sends off alarm bells for the real sceptics. My opinion is that um, I would imagine that the authors, or as the case might be, groups of people, that they make these claims based on their subjective truth or even inductive truth. It's certainly not supported as a scientific truth. It's what they feel and believe to be true based on their senses. Now, what I believe can be substantiated is that Helena not only did reside with the Tibetan monks and learn their wisdom, a Buddhist had told me that she's referred to as an enlightened person uh, to this day, and they knew about her because they'd heard about her when they were spending time in a Buddhist monastery themselves. She's also recorded to have spent time in India and to have resided in both the UK and the US, and she was introducing people to notions of spirit by way of seances and so forth at a time when these countries were steeped in 
very Christian practices. Um, so she was incredibly unorthodox during her time. So it was at this time, because of the seances, that she was accused of fraud and faking, and she was definitely discredited and personally attacked by many people during these times. I believe that she challenged the social structure, and not only because of the way she lived her life in this regard, but because she refused to be boxed into her gender-defined roles as other women did back in the day. And by that, what I mean is, from a personal perspective, when she was 17 years old, she was forced into an arranged marriage by her parents where there were social expectations put on her. He was 23 years older than her and the marriage was doomed to failure because she was actually a rebel. Um, I would imagine she would have been quite difficult for them to manage. She's later reported as wearing men's trousers and smoking cigars, um, which I believe also demonstrates the fact that she was a non-conformist. Now, where she probably really threw a cat amongst the pigeons is that while she did dress and carry herself in this way, she's alleged to have formed a romantic relationship or partnership with a married man. So she definitely rocked um, the social structure of society. So at the end of the day, while um, I certainly wouldn't condone um, breaching of vows, shall we say, of marriage, within the context that these people were forced into marriages, perhaps it's understandable. But I admire the lady for the fact that she adhered to her own authentic self at a time when she would have just been absolutely pilloried for the choices that she made. Um, one of the other things that's quite fascinating as far as the esoteric goes is that she was into all of this stuff and part of the argument against her is that she joined not that she joined, she returned to the Russian Orthodox Church before she passed away. I don't see that as an issue myself um, because to me it kind of makes sense that when you believe in a creator God that you want to be part of a group of people and to um, do a certain amount of worship if this is your thing. Um, so to me it's perfectly natural. She's also the founder of what is called the Theosophers Society. Um, I considered joining it many years ago, but it looked to me a bit like they were worshipping the messenger instead of the messages. And I've always had issues with stuff like that, so I didn't join. I do welcome your feedback and thoughts, though. Um, if you know more about Helena or um, anything like that, I'm always open to hear it. Anyway, moving on. So I'd found a number of quotes by Blavatsky over the years that I felt resonated with me. Unfortunately, right now, though, um, as I do this audio, I actually can't find where I initially sourced her quotes or this quote that I've got on the screen, but it's one that stayed with me anyway. Knowledge is wisdom, and wisdom that is not used for the greater good is wisdom that's wasted. Um, it's something like that. And I, I really am not sure where I found it, but another saying that I remember um, seeing somewhere was that truth is knowledge. So this leads to something else. So I was able to string together my own personal motto around truth, if we like. Um, so truth, as in facts, is variable based on what we know to be true at any given time, all right? Because the pool of information that we're looking at can change with new information. Knowledge is wisdom, and wisdom that is not used for the greater good is wisdom wasted. Now this is because, going back to it, scientific truth is not categoric. It's also arguable amongst scientists with differing opinions, and truth and knowledge are subjective and inductive, and they, these can both be reliable sources of information gathering, even if there's no maths applied to it. So in answer to the questions of what and how does energy work, here are my conclusions based on my truth, my understandings, my knowledge, and my understandings around energy may change at some point in the future as new information comes to me. And this might be the same for you. So the way that I understand energy and vibration actually came to me through an incident or an event that happened in my life and it inspired um, me to formulate an opinion if you like. So I'll explain it to you. Um, it was a difficult time 
for me, um, I was receiving some difficult questions from my children. And what had happened was I was a single mum at the time. I was finding it difficult to get babysitters. And on these days when I couldn't get a babysitter, I would take my children to work with me. Now, this obviously was against my workplace rules. I'm not going to go too far into this because, of course, um, I have people's identities to protect with this. Um, so anyway, my job was to go to a public space for an hour at the most at different times of the week. And on these days, as I said, I would take the children with me and I would position them where I could see them and where I could do my job at the same time. However, on the particular day in, that I'm referring to, a man collapsed and to some extent I taught my children with hand signals, you know, stay where you are, I'll be back soon, stuff like that. So anyway, a man collapses at work, bangs his head on on the ground during the fall, small amount of blood on his forehead. His wife is hysterical because she knew that he was dying um, and everything was in total panic mode. There was members of the public everywhere all screaming at me to do something because obviously I was an employee. I certainly had no training in first aid at this point in time. I put my hands on him. I had done, by the way, my Reiki achievements at this stage, but I didn't know how to do CPR. I did later learn, just to put this into perspective, that even if I'd known CPR, uh, he wouldn't have survived, right? It was definitely his time to go. So in the process of being screamed at that I needed to do something, uh, his wife couldn't hold him, all of that stuff. Um, one of the members of the public was saying, do something, do something, hold him. The lady was too hysterical to even touch him. This was his wife. So what I ended up doing was I semi lay down beside the man on the ground and I was holding him while he died because that was all I needed, all I knew to do within this situation. And if you like, it was kind of a praying for ease of transition. Um, and while this was going on, of course, as a mother, I had my concerns for my children who were out of my sight, who I couldn't see at that particular time. And I had to put my faith in the universe to protect them and keep them safe. At the same time, it was all very intense. The wife continued to be screaming hysterically. And now I understand this. I'm not judging her for this. I want to be clear about this. Um, I would imagine it was horrendous for her. Um, it went on for about 10 minutes. The ambulance was very late. And then all of a sudden you could hear a little voice calling out from my 10 year old son saying, mom, what are you doing, right? This little voice broke through the screaming and the hysteria. Now there was a real crowd gathered around with many people watching and distressed. So of course my immediate thoughts were, oh my God, it's my son, mother duties. I can't say anything. I can't call out to him. I've got people watching me. People are saying, who is that child? Where is that child? Where's that child's mother? Right? And I'm thinking, if they find out that I've brought my children to work, I'll lose my job. So initially I didn't respond. And, you know, there was all these hushed whispers. And then my son's voice became more insistent. Mom. Um, so I had no choice but to call out to my son saying, it's okay, mate. Right? Australian. Just go back around the side and I'll be there in a little while. Just wait until I come for you. He was with his sisters who were standing out of sight, so I, it was okay. And then all you could hear was the voices of, oh my God, it's hers, it's her child. Now, where I'm going with this is I actually feel goosey just talking about this, right? It was a truly incredible experience anyway. But I will say that something really miraculous happened at that time. Before my son had come out and we could hear his voice, I could feel the man's spirit was struggling to stay with his body. Now, it's very difficult to explain this to people who haven't experienced death at close quarters, shall we say. But um, those people that have experienced dying may have had this experience as well because I understand that it's not that uncommon but as I say I could feel that his voice was or that his spirit was struggling to remain with his body now what happened after this was that I actually found felt the snap right now we're going to go into what we learned so as I said before the man that was dying was an elderly man and his wife was an elderly lady now clearly they were grandparents now what was truly amazing to me was once my son had poked his head around and called out this woman was incredible she went straight in a snap moment herself from being hysterical um, 
calling to the man not to die and not to leave her to having her mouth on the ground because I could basically see her in one eye and um, turn my head very slightly and see my son. And uh, anyway, what I watched her do was in a moment, in a second, she went from being hysterical woman to standing upright, sucking the hysteria back into herself, regaining her composure so that she could be calm in front of the child. It was truly amazing. And uh, to me, I think this is the power of motherhood, what women and mothers are capable of doing for the sake of their children. She was in her moment of grief and suddenly she brought it together because there was a child and she didn't want the child to witness the suffering. Now, what I also find fantastic about the universe is if we think everything is divinely um, connected and that kind of stuff in this time frame. When my son has put his head around and called out, what he did was he provided a, dist a distraction. As I said, I felt the snap um, where I knew once I returned my attention to the man on the ground that his spirit had left his body. The lady was actually um, calmer and I felt that he, anyway, he was there. The ambulance arrived anyway, and I was able to get my children. So this is where I came to my own um, understanding of what energy and vibration is about. So after the ambulance has arrived and I've re, you know, gathered my children up and we're getting ready to go home, my son shared with me that he felt very sad for the man because he had died. And my, even though I hadn't told my son that he had died, my son said that he felt that he had died. Now, my first reactions, of course, as a mother were guilt that I'd just exposed my children to this by taking them to work with me. And then I had a divine inspiration because I also felt, well, I can't lie because your knee-jerk reaction is to protect your children. So, oh, no, 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 darling, he didn't die, but he actually did. So we have to be honest with him. So I thought I needed a way to make it easier for my children to understand that death is a natural part of life and that rather than becoming consumed by a fear of death that they learn to accept that death is life as well and this is what I came up with so I dug really deep and I asked you know obviously for the universe to help me with the words and um, what I ended up saying to him was you know hey son remember the other day when I came home from the bush I'd been at a bush I brought back a snake skin to you and I told you that as the snake grows to or as it grows bigger it gets too big for its skin so it sheds it and he goes oh yes yeah I said well the soul is kind of like that it wears the body until the soul is too big for it and then it sheds the body and it takes a new shape but the thing is you can't see this particular shape like a physical body because the body is kind of like a rock I love the kind of you know you just throw those in but anyway this is what I've said to him and more now remember of course I'm talking to a child so I said look you can touch a rock and it feels pretty solid doesn't it when you put your finger on the rock you can't put your finger through it plus it's a little bit heavy to pick up because it's a solid mass if you can pick it up and you were hold it up able to hold it up to the sunlight the sunlight doesn't shine through it because the rock has a shadow right this is what the physical body is like um, you can't stick your finger through it because it's solid if you can pick it up it's heavy depending on the size of the person and if you were hold, to hold the body up to the sunlight the sun doesn't shine through it because you can tell because the body's got a shadow so the physical body's like a rock so the other thing is too that once the body is gone the spirit remains and the spirit is in an ongoing process of growth is what I've said to him now if you think about this I said because they no longer have a body they don't have a voice box so we can no longer speak to them like what we used to we have to find different ways of communicating with them and I said so you know the first point of when a spirit is gone is that it feels a bit like a feather doesn't it we can feel it because um, when the spirit touches us it is very soft and gentle like the feather right and also like the feather because it's kind of weightless it's not heavy and if you hold the feather up to the light you can actually see the light coming through it it doesn't really make a shadow sometimes it might but not much at all right this is like the spirit I said to him 
So naturally, the questions didn't stop there. We are talking about a child. But I believe that I was guided um, within this entire process because I then went on to say or offer an explanation where I said, look, you know, as the spirit continues to grow, it becomes lighter and lighter, a bit like the steam that comes from the kettle. Um, It starts off fairly solid. You know, we look at the water in the kettle here. Um, It can be quite heavy, but it becomes obviously once you add heat to it it becomes like the steam and it gets lighter and lighter until it disperses into the atmosphere and then it gathers and it um, floats down obviously in rain if we're talking about steam and it returns to earth in a physical solid form again and it starts over so to me that refers to the life cycle actually so my son seemed to be satisfied with the story and I agreed with him that it was still sad because his wife was so upset and of course his loved ones will be sad that he has no longer got a a body but I said it was you know we can look at the positive of this that the old man was free from um, this physical body that was ailing him because he actually had been quite ill apparently and he was very frail and I said he can now move around as he wanted to and he could still be with his wife whenever she thought of him because thinking of a person was kind of like an etheric telephone. When we think of a person, that's like sending out a call and that spirit will come immediately to the person thinking about it. So I said, but the same as anything, because once again, going back to that voice box thing, there would be new communication methods. She'd have to learn a new language because her husband no longer had a voice box. So anyway, he seemed to accept that, but moving along. So within this experience, I was able to make sense of what we refer to as the light body, Um, you know, especially upon reflecting of the story and the way it popped into my head. Terminology and language can be really complex, but the process is often quite simple just difficult to explain so while everyone can accept that we have a physical body full of blood cells neurons and so forth that are invisible to the naked eye um, but with the right tools we can actually see this uh, physiological cellular structure Um, the body is bound together by all sorts of material parts including the blood and even our liquids are a dense mass right they're dense they're heavy they're thick um, they're not transparent Um, the cellular structure within the body is always in constant movement but i come back to it's not transparent right when energy workers are referring to the light body we're talking about the light body because of the amount of light that shines through the body that is the aura right the faster the aura mm, let me think about how to express this properly so if the person's physical body is inside of the aura and the aura is a number of layers, okay? Within these layers, the cells, we'll call them cells, um, atoms, whatever, these are in constant movement as well. And the slower they move, the lower or the denser the aura is said to be. The faster they move, the lighter the aura is said to be. Now, there is a reason for this, and I'm not sure that I can demonstrate this Um, visually but I think if you were to do your own research you might find something that um, talks about this if you've got a whole heap of cells that are moving really fast or if you think about even actually I just thought of the perfect example if you're watching a fan turning uh, a pedestal fan and it's got the solid rotors on it right you can't see through the rotors but when that fan when those blades are moving and it's spinning really fast you can see it looks a bit like you're seeing through them doesn't it you can see what is behind because the rotors are moving so fast now in many ways this is what we talk about when we're talking about the light bodies and the motion and the vibration is these cells are spinning and moving around constantly so the faster they move the more light comes through, the more light we can experience. Hopefully that's clear. So just to revisit this and potentially convey it in different words, feel free to put your comments up. I appreciate all feedback, okay? So just revisiting this, the cellular structure of the aura, for want of a better word, is referred to as vibration. 
right? And vibration refers to the speed at which the cellular structure of an aura moves and how much light can shine through. The aura is referred to as the light body, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The lightness of a person's aura is due to the weight, right? How heavy that aura is, um, or and then the other one is the denseness of it because it's a light body measured by how much light sunlight can shine through it so an aura that is lighter less dense in brackets is softer gentler and more weightless and at liberty to move more freely with greater ease I truly hope that um, the information that I'm providing here is doing at least a semblance of justice to this amazing subject. But anyway, let's try and apply what I've been um, sharing with you here to the images, right? On the left hand side, we can see an image of the physical body with the chakras as part of the physical body. The chakras also have weight or density. Um, and we can't see them through with our naked eyes. The chakras can be sped up to lighten our aura. And in fact, this is the process of raising our vibration. When we energize our chakras and our physical body in preparation for energy work, or as maintaining our own um, personal vibration for healthy energy function, we can, um, this is where the chakra exercises come in because we can balance them and make sure they're running in uh, working oh my god what is that word working in synchronicity and the perfect function right so we work on these chakras so that we can maintain our aura right when we work at a particularly low vibration and we're consumed with the earthly needs we're stuck in the base chakra and consumed by fears so the key for all of us is to raise the vibration of the entire chakra system so that we can function with greater balance in our lives um, and have a lighter aura and feel lighter and better about ourselves now as we do this even though we've still got our physical body we become more like the image on the right um yeah, that blue one with the little bit of rainbow. If somebody was to do, um, what are they called, the aurasoma images or whatever, this is what they get when they take photographs, if you like. Um, I think that image, however, I'm talking about the one on the right, ref probably speaks more to what we call an astral bottle. I can't even speak. An astral body. But we'll talk about that another day. But as our soul evolves, it gets whiter, lighter, brighter, because the vibration continues to grow. And if you see in this central image, you can see that the light is like an egg shape that is around them. I mean, that's not a really good true egg shape, but it's it's a pretty good idea or a pretty good demonstration, really, because technically speaking, the aura is about 1.5 metres from all points of the body that is above, below, left, right. Okay. So whether or not you're a sceptic, um, I do hope that today I've been able to offer you something that holds some meaning to you um, and helps you to improve the quality of your own life. And whether that is simply a case of offering you an opportunity to expand your mind or your thinking or to understand concepts behind the ideas and discussions of energy and vibration um, is fine by me. I share all my information based on my subjective and experiential understanding of the topic, unless I cite reference and research material um, and quite often it's inductive too. I do encourage you to do your own research and establish what feels true for you in the absence of scientific evidential facts um, and this is because at the end of the day science is about the numbers and energy is about people. I do believe however that it would be possible for the scientists to conduct um, research on a lot of this stuff as did Pythagoras um, and include maths in the in the conclusions if you like but that is probably not going to happen in the near future so in the meantime i just want to say thank you very much for your time for your patience i know that i stumble over my words as i say this is new to me um i tend to be quite a private person generally speaking and so 
it can only get better, shall we say. I'm pushing myself forward to share this information with you in the hope that it makes a difference to your life. So for now, thank you for being with me. Have a beautiful and glorious day. May the sun shine warmly upon your soul. Happy days, my friends. Happy days. Take care.